Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. On November 18th, 1993, Nirvana took the stage for what would ultimately be one of their last shows. They were playing a televised set for MTV Unplugged, an acoustic showcase where rock bands could perform in a more intimate atmosphere. In typical rebellious Nirvana fashion, the band chose to play almost none of their big hits, instead building their set list around deep album cuts and rounding it out with a handful of covers. Some of these covers radically altered the material, but the most iconic song of the night was played almost exactly like the original recording, because that recording had already captured everything Cobain wanted it to say. Everything he needed from it was already there. That's how Kurt Cobain introduced a new generation to The Man Who Sold the World, an underrated classic from David Bowie's early career. Bowie wrote the song when he was just 19 years old, but with it he told a powerful story that resonated through the decades to inspire another of rock's greatest legends, and still resonates today. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. <laughs> with its iconic riff played by Mick Ronson. This is another one of those minimum riffs I always talk about, built on such a simple idea that any small change is likely to completely ruin it, but if you play it exactly right, it's magical. The basic premise is just a trill around A. We start on the root, step down, return, step up, return again, step down again, and that's it. That's the whole riff. So why does it work so well? The first thing to mention is the rhythm. There's eight notes here, but instead of playing them all as eighth notes, they hang on that first G, then rush the next couple notes to catch up. The G is our departure point, where we break away from these clean, consistent A's, and this pause leaves us standing at the precipice waiting to take that leap of faith. That's followed by a flurry of activity as we cram that B-flat into just a 16th note, and he's not even really playing it, or at least he's not picking it. It sounds like he's bending the string, although I suppose it could also be a slide, not sure. Point is, the next three notes are played as one attack, so the B-flat becomes almost like a ghost note, clearly there, but also kinda not. The other main factor here is the scale. There's only three different notes, but it's just enough to put us in A Phrygian, which is like minor, but with a flat two. Phrygian is often associated with evil and foreboding, but here the word I'd use to describe it is otherworldly. Besides the perfect intervals, that is the fourth, fifth, and octave, the major second is the only note that stays the same between the major and minor scales. Since most Western popular music is written in major, minor, or somewhere in between, we're pretty used to hearing performers mix and match different kinds of thirds, sixths, and sevenths, but the second tends to be pretty constant. We know what kind of second to expect, so the fleeting appearance of a B-flat hidden away on an offbeat 16th note hints at this faint aura of trance-like mystery that runs through the piece. If we replace it with a B-natural, it's… okay? But not nearly as compelling. After a couple bars of that, Tony Visconti's bass comes in, and he's playing in a different key. Or rather, he's reframing our sense of tonality. Up to now, all we've been hearing is the riff, which mostly just sits on A. Or, okay, there's also an acoustic guitar quietly strumming chords, which we'll talk about eventually, but the point is, it's easy to hear the first couple bars in A Phrygian. But Visconti's line is pretty clearly an F, and with the bass and drums suddenly crashing in together here, it's hard not to read this as the one chord. So what's going on? Well, F major and A Phrygian are what are called relative keys. That is, they have all the same notes, they just use them differently. This usually comes up when we're talking about relative major and minor, so for instance F major and D minor have the same notes but different roots. A lot of songs play around in this sort of shared space, and part of the reason it works so well is that the roots of our two keys, in this case F and D, are a third apart, so they sound in harmony with each other. They form a consonant pair, with a minor root on the bottom and the major root on top, so you can easily resolve to both of them at the same time. And relative Phrygian works pretty much the same way. Again, all the notes are identical, and our two roots F and A are still a third apart. The only difference is that this time the major root is on the bottom. We've inverted the relationship. This creates a sort of harmonic, uncanny valley, where the tool is familiar, but it's not being used quite like we're used to. Throughout the song, we'll be drifting back and forth in the liminal space between F major and A Phrygian, so I don't think Visconti is really changing the key here. Instead, I think he's just offering an alternate viewpoint. For Ronson, A is the root, and for Visconti it's the third, but either way it's stable, so there's no real conflict between the two interpretations. They both work at the same time. In the verse, though, it sounds like Bowie agrees with Ronson, because his melody could not be more clearly in A. We start by walking down from the root to the fifth, we passed up on the with an extra lower neighboring tone at the bottom to really stick the landing on E. From there, he walks back up, encircling the A by playing the notes on either side before resolving. 
something. This, oak of was a this strongly implies that A is our root. To hear this melody in F, you'd have to hear the E at the end of the first line as a leading tone, trying to resolve up a half step to the root, which it doesn't do. And I don't know, maybe that is how you hear it. Maybe it sounds like a subverted leading tone to you, in which case, sure, F is the right analysis, but for me, it's pretty clearly not. I've tried to convince myself to hear this version, and I just can't. Either way, though, he sings this line twice, then moves on to the second half of the verse. Here, he moves up, starting the first line on C, which gave us some surprise, and the second on D, I spoke into his eyes, raising the range in order to build intensity. Instead of continuing that upward trajectory, though, he drops to a near monotone, I thought you died alone, hammering the root before falling down to F, a sort of gesture towards Visconti's major key. We're starting to fade back in that direction. He closes the verse out by singing something that sounds a lot like the first line, a long, long time ago. but this time he hangs on F, which does make the final E feel a bit more like that leading tone we were looking for earlier. The F analysis is becoming more and more appealing as we head into the chorus. But before we leave the verse, we need to talk about Woody Woodmancy's percussion. Or percussions, I guess, because he's playing two different parts, separated by panning. If I just play the right side... You hear a pretty basic rock groove played on a standard trap set kit, but if I play the left side instead... There's a little bleed through, but the dominant sound is a Latin American percussion instrument called a guiro. On the backbeat, where the snare would be, he plays this long scraping sound, and then there's this extra offbeat accent with a short sharp strike on the eighth note after beat three. This gives the guiro pattern an off-kilter vibe, drawing your attention to a weird part of the bar, and since the guiro is the dominant sound in the mix, the whole verse takes on that same uneven quality. But why two percussion parts? I mean, it's not unusual to have extra percussion instruments to complement the drum groove, but that doesn't feel like what's happening here. The hard panning completely separates them, so it feels more like you're stuck between two rhythmic worlds, kind of like the two tonal worlds in the intro. And since this seems to be a recurring theme, I think it's probably time to ask what this song is about. And the answer is complicated. The lyrics are intentionally vague and the narrative has no clear direction, leaving it pretty open to interpretation. But one way to read it, and one that I find particularly compelling, is that it's about the profound sense of existential loss that one feels when one's art becomes a commodity. Basically, it's about selling out. When you become a public figure and your livelihood depends on your ability to tell stories about yourself in ways that connect on a deep, personal level with millions of strangers, it can feel like you've sold your entire world in exchange for that fame. You need to be authentic, but audiences don't recognize real authenticity, so instead you manufacture a sort of heightened authenticity, a mask that tells the truth. You craft a persona, a you that looks good on camera, and you learn to inhabit that persona, wearing it like a second skin, until you can switch it on and off at a moment's notice. And personas were a driving force across Bowie's entire career, adopting different characters at different periods of his life, like Ziggy Stardust, The Blind Prophet, and The Thin White Duke. While they were, on the surface, caricatures, each one was built on a grain of truth, some insight into Bowie's authentic self, which he was dismantling and selling off piece by piece. Even at 19 years old, he was already starting to feel the weight of that loss, and this song feels to me like an exploration of the cost of selling his world. And the percussion is, I think, a particularly good example of why. On one side, you have a simple, marketable drum groove, while on the other, you have a less familiar instrument, at least to a British rock audience, playing a jagged, uneven accent pattern. The common refrain in songwriting classes is that you want to balance the familiar with the exciting, and here we have both, but they're not talking to each other. They're two separate sounds pulling your ear in two different directions. You feel the same tension listening to the song that Bowie felt making it. This song actually does a lot of hard panning. That acoustic guitar I mentioned in the intro is panned so far to the right that all I had to do to isolate the riff was play you the left side. <laughs> This makes it feel like most of the instruments are coming from far away, creating a sense of space and distance that the narrator inhabits outside the material concerns of his music. And finally, let's talk harmony. As you might expect, the section starts on an A chord, but perhaps surprisingly considering the Phrygian melody, it's A major. I can think of a couple different explanations here. First, whenever I see minor melodies over major harmonies, I immediately think of the blues, and this song definitely has a strong blues influence. Or more precisely, it has a psychedelic influence, and the psychedelia movement grew largely 
mostly out of blues rock. So yeah, that's definitely part of what's happening here. But also, using A major helps clarify the key center after that ambiguous intro. A minor can be easily explained in both keys, but A major makes way more sense in one than the other. If we're in A Phrygian, then this chord is just borrowed from the parallel major, which happens all the time. In F though, while there are certainly ways to explain it, they require some fancier tools, so the relative simplicity of the A analysis makes it feel more natural. And finally, A major gives us much more interesting voice leading. The first four chords of this section are A, D minor, A, and F. These all contain an A, so we can just hold that steady throughout. For the other two notes, we can take this C sharp and E, slide them both up a half step to make D minor, then slide them back down to make A again. From here, the two notes move by half step again, but this time in opposite directions, splitting up and heading to F and C natural. This contrary motion and the contrast between the two different kinds of C makes the arrival of the F chord feel fresh and exciting. If we'd use A minor instead, the motion is inconsistent and flat, and the F barely feels like a change at all. From there, we go to C, which is a really interesting chord here because it behaves very differently in our two keys. In F, it's the 5 chord, and it points us back to 1. In A, on the other hand, it's the flat 3, which is largely a substitute for the 1. Since it's a much stronger sound in F, and we just heard an F chord, I'm inclined to hear this as an indication that the song is moving in that direction. That expectation gets subverted, though, as we instead return to A, then D minor, just like the start of the verse. It's a brief, fleeting glimpse of the brighter major tonality before Phrygian reasserts itself. That said, this D chord is where the melody starts to incorporate F, so it's not a full return. It's more like a handoff, passing the major baton from one part to another. This sets us up for the chorus, which sounds a lot more like F major. I mean, not entirely. The melody keeps resolving to A, I never lost control. but again, A is a stable point in both keys, and the harmony is not subtle. They mostly alternate between F major and C major, the two strongest chords in the key. However, we do get the occasional intrusion of D flat major, which they emphasize with a new rhythm. And once again, there's a couple ways to read this chord. Most obviously, it's the flat 6 borrowed from the parallel minor, giving this bright, shiny progression a shadow of regret. But more importantly, remember how in the verse we had that really cool voice leading thing from A major to F major? You know, where one note held still and the others moved by half step in opposite directions? Well, D flat major to F major does the exact same thing. We've brought that sound back in a new context, and it makes the lines this appears under sound particularly striking. When he sings, I never lost control, it sounds like, Okay, you know that thing where real smiles involve your eyes but fake ones don't? This line sounds like that. Our narrator is grinning, assuring us everything is okay, but his eyes, harmonically speaking, are dead. And there's another trick here. D-flat has this special voice leading relationship with F major, but it also has it with A major. In fact, these three chords form a kind of cycle, and we can get that same dramatic effect by moving from any one of them to any other. I'm not sure I'd call it a resolution, but it's a really distinctive sound, and it makes all the progressions feel a little uncanny and disjointed. And the chorus takes advantage of this shared relationship. The first time we hear D-flat, it goes back to F, but the second time it exits to the riff with the acoustic guitar playing A major. The voice leading is symmetrical both times, so it feels like the same chord motion even though we wind up somewhere completely different. But that's just the harmony. The far more important change is that everything speeds up. I mean, not the tempo, that stays roughly the same, but all the rhythms are compressed. Bowie is singing shorter phrases, the guiro is replaced by a constant driving shaker, and Visconti and Ronson are doing this. walking up the entire scale under each chord. Even the harmony is moving faster. In the verse, each chord lasted two bars, but in the chorus, they're only one bar each. This manic energy, combined with a shiny, happy key change, makes this feel like a performance. He's put the mask back on. In the verses, he's by himself, wandering around in some random stairwell, and the music is disconnected from the world. But then, he's challenged. He meets someone who tells him he's faded away, and he has to shift back to that manufactured persona to ensure everyone that he's still there. He never lost control. Control. And this fear at the thought of being forgotten may have been drawn from Bowie's own experience. After the success of Space Oddity, his follow-up efforts were failing to perform, and the dream of rock stardom was quickly slipping away. But this shift doesn't happen immediately. In between the verse and chorus, there's a couple bars where they slowly build up to it, sitting on a single chord as different instruments join in. <laughs> Oh, no.
In this, we hear the weight and fatigue crushing our protagonist. We hear the gears turning as he drags his imaginary self up from the depths, putting on the disguise piece by piece until he becomes the person he knows he's expected to be. It's a hard battle, and it's getting harder, but he knows he can't give up. He can't lose control, or he will have sold his world for nothing. And so he wakes up for another day and puts that mask back on, once again transforming himself from a human being to a larger-than-life icon, an empty vessel through which the world can see his stories. From there, we play through those sections a couple more times, then end up in the outro. Here, Ronson keeps playing the riff repeatedly for over a minute. Underneath, the rest of the band plays a loop of A, D minor, F, D minor. These three chords all contain A, so each one recontextualizes the riff as being a different chord tone, and the D minor serves as a pivot between our two possible key centers. Or maybe not. Remember how at the very beginning I said that D minor also has a relative relationship with these other two keys? Well, I kind of feel like now it's coming to the forefront. D minor gets played twice as often, and it's also the loop's destination, which means it gets approached by the strongest harmonic motion. We've stepped into a third tonality, a sort of liminal space between our two key centers, and these two chords that were our homes now feel like they're intruding. And here's the thing that blows my mind. That space was always there. This is what the acoustic guitar was playing underneath the riff every single time, but it kept getting cut off before it could really establish itself. The void was waiting for us the whole time, a point Bowie drives home by layering wordless moans over the section, starting with one voice, and building up to a tortured, disjointed choir, before it ultimately fades out without ever really resolving. And that's pretty much it, but before we go, I want to come back to that Nirvana cover, because the thing that really strikes me about it is how little of this they changed. Heck, Bowie's own re-recorded version, released in 1995, was way more experimental than Nirvana's. Of course, it's not exactly the same. They were playing a live set with only a couple musicians, so no one's playing the organ or the guiro, but besides that, it's a pretty faithful recreation of the original. Cobain even ran his acoustic guitar through some effect pedals to recreate that distorted tone on the main riff. To me, this sends a pretty clear message. The crushing weight of manufactured authenticity that David Bowie was struggling with in 1970 still resonated with Kurt Cobain almost 25 years later. And Bowie seems to have recognized that. He said that he wished he'd been able to talk to Cobain about it, but sadly, he never got the chance. But the struggles of making art in the context of being known, of turning your life and your soul into products marketed to an audience who wants to buy the right to know you, is so much bigger than Bowie and Cobain, and it hasn't gone away. Now, more than ever, artists in the spotlight still have to sell their entire worlds, and we still expect them to never lose control. Crap, I'm gonna have to transition into a plug for my Patreon now, aren't I? <sighs> well, this is awkward. But, yeah, Thanks for watching. As always, this song was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.